Father, it's a great joy to be in your house, to worship you, to give you praise. And Lord, even now as we listen to your word, we ask, Father, that we will hide your words in our hearts. Help us not just to be hearers, but to be doers of your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Before you sit down, can you please turn to your neighbour and say, I'm so glad to see you here. Priscilla and Aquila, a Christian married couple, and Apollos, a Jewish preacher, are featured in today's sermon text from Acts chapter 18, verses 24 to 28. Aquila was a Jew, but Priscilla's ethnicity is unclear. She could either be a Roman or a Jew. The couple are first mentioned in verse 2 of the same chapter, chapter 18. They had come from Italy to Corinth after Emperor Claudius banished all Jews from Rome in AD 49. They were tent makers by profession. And when they first met Paul in Corinth, they welcomed him into their tent making business as Paul was in a similar trade. And they welcomed him also into their home. Paul lived and worked with them while he founded the church in Corinth. During this time, the couple would have learned much from the Apostle Paul. The three of them became steadfast friends and ministry co-workers. Later, Priscilla and Aquila traveled with Paul from Corinth to Ephesus. And when Paul left Ephesus, they stayed behind and they established a church in their home. They were devoted Christians, strong in faith, and devoted to the church. As Paul often sent them greetings in his letters, it is probable that they played leadership roles in the early church. While Paul was away from Ephesus, Priscilla and Aquila met Apollos, a Jew from Alexandria who had come to Ephesus. Apollos was eloquent, competent in the scriptures, fervent in the spirit, and instructed in the way of the Lord. He taught the things concerning Jesus accurately. However, his understanding was incomplete, as he knew only the baptism of John. He preached repentance and faith in Jesus, However, he did not understand the significance of Jesus' death, resurrection, and mission. We are not told what was lacking in Apollos' understanding, but it was possible that he had no knowledge of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost or of Christ's great commission to the disciples. He may not have known about the founding of the New Testament church or its global mission to the Gentiles. Priscilla and Aquila were gifted teachers who had a comprehensive grasp of Christian doctrine. They heard Apollos preach and picked up on his insufficient understanding. So they gently took him aside and filled in the gaps in his theology. Apollos went on to Achaia, and armed with a more complete understanding of the gospel, he greatly helped those who through grace had believed, for he powerfully refuted the Jews in public, showing by the scriptures that the Christ was Jesus. When Apollos was in Corinth, he attracted a following among the Christians there. And we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, about divisions in the church, with some claiming to follow Paul, some claiming to follow Apollos, and others claiming to follow Peter. Paul had to deal with these factions and bring the church back to unity in Christ. Apollos is last mentioned in Titus chapter 3, verse 13, where Paul requested Titus to help Apollos with whatever he needed. 
Paul regarded Apollos as a valued co-worker and friend. Bible commentators refer to Priscilla and Aquila as mentors of Apollos. The couple were very intentional in teaching Apollos what was lacking in his understanding. Their goal was achieved when Apollos went on to realize his potential as a significant and powerful preacher, evangelist, and apologist. The sermon topic for today is the ministry of mentoring. The word mentoring is not mentioned in the Bible, but it is a biblical concept as we find many examples of mentoring in the Bible. For example, Moses and Joshua, Elijah and Elisha, Paul and Timothy, Jesus and his 12 disciples. Mentoring means different things to different people. There's a whole lot written and taught on this subject. Some who teach it make a very clear distinction between counselling, consulting, coaching, and mentoring. Others make it a point to clearly distinguish mentoring and coaching as there are many points of overlap between these two. My focus today is on mentoring, so let me zero in on that. The common understanding is that mentoring starts with a mentee seeking out a mentor for advice. The mentor is someone who is more experienced than the mentee, someone the mentee can learn from to achieve what the mentor has already succeeded in. Another way of putting it is the mentee desires to learn from a mentor who has successfully walked the same path that the mentee is just beginning. In the case of Apollos, he did not seek out Priscilla and Aquila. They came to him and offered to teach him what was lacking in his understanding. Mentoring can also happen that way. And you know, Apollos was a great preacher, but much to his credit, he was humble enough to be mentored by Priscilla and Aquila. The mentor and mentee must be comfortable with one another and be willing to be open and transparent with one another. It usually begins rather informally with both parties sitting down and having conversations to discern if they are a right fit for the mentoring relationship. The mentor must be available to commit his or her time to the mentee and the mentee must also be committed to follow the mentor's advice and to complete any assignments given. I found Pastor Benny Ho's definition of mentoring to be quite helpful. According to him, mentoring is an intentional relationship where the mentor identifies and facilitates the work of God in the life of a mentee to the end of growing him or her in spirituality, character, attitude, and skill. According to this definition, mentoring is firstly intentional. Both mentor and mentee are committed to one another for a season of mentoring. What the mentee wants to learn from the mentor is clearly identified. The regularity of their meetings, including the time and the venue, are also agreed upon. Secondly, mentoring is relational. It takes place in the context of a nurturing and a loving relationship. It involves not just teaching, although teaching is a key component, but it also includes role modeling and sharing of life experiences. As mentor and mentee grow in their openness and transparency with one another, they will develop a close bond of trust and respect. For this reason, mentoring should be between persons of the same gender, unless it is done in a group setting rather than one-on-one. -on -one. Thirdly, the mentor identifies and facilitates God's work in the mentee's life. 
it is important to recognize that God is doing the work in the life of the mentee. The mentor is merely an instrument in God's hands to facilitate God's work in the mentee's life. And then fourthly, mentoring has an end goal. The end goal is to acquire new knowledge, skills and insights from a more experienced mentor who has been there and done that with much success. I used to bemoan the fact that I couldn't find a mentor for myself. However, as I reflected more deeply on this topic, I realised that God had provided me with mentors in different seasons of my life, though at the time, I did not think of what they did as mentoring. I thank God for two mentors in particular and would like to share how I benefited from their mentoring. My first mentor was Jennifer Chua, and I met her when I was 15 years of age. That was a pretty long time ago. Let me give you some background which led to our meeting. I had been attending Sunday school regularly since I was a child. All along, I thought I was a Christian, but I never had a personal relationship with our Lord Jesus Christ. It was only when I was 14 that I realized Jesus died for my sin and I accepted him as the Savior and the Lord of my life. I floundered in my newfound faith. After accepting Christ, nobody taught me what the Christian faith was all about or how to live the Christian life. And so for one year, I constantly doubted if I was really safe. I must have accepted Christ at least five times in the course of that one year. God, in his mercy, led me to New Bridge Road Brethren Chapel and to Jennifer Chua, who was a Sunday school teacher there. I told her I needed help because I did not know if I was saved. She promptly took me under her wing. I would go to her home once a week, and over a period of four months, she taught me what the Christian faith was all about and how I was to live the Christian life. She helped me build a strong faith foundation upon which I could continue building and grow in my relationship with God. I'm very grateful to Jennifer for mentoring me because of what I personally went through in terms of the struggles, the doubts, you know, about my salvation. I'm very passionate about helping new believers build a strong foundation for their Christian faith. I had moved to another church when I received news that Jennifer had passed on rather suddenly. She and her husband were completing their term as missionaries in Sabah and they were preparing to come home to Singapore when she met with a fatal road accident. She was only in her mid-50s. I attended her week service in Living Sanctuary Brethren Church. The church was filled to the brim. There were so many she had discipled who wanted to give eulogies in memory of her but only a few could do so because of time constraints. I remember one particular eulogy by a young man who shared that on one occasion, he was appointed to head a church project and he was wondering who he should invite to be in his team. Jennifer's advice to him was, don't only choose the good ones to be in your team, but work with the weaker ones where they are and help them to become the best that they can be. I did not realize it then, but Jennifer certainly knew what mentoring was all about. Don't only choose the good ones to be in your team, but work with the weaker ones where they are and help them to become the best 
that they can be. The second person who comes to mind is James Chan. I did not intentionally seek him out to be my mentor, but James somehow fell into that role. When I came into the full-time ministry, I relied on my legal training to solve people's problems. That was the only way I knew how. I would sit the person down, gather all the facts from him or her, and from there, identify the problem and then prescribe a solution to the problem. I was doing that for years without realizing I was a fixer rather than a healer. One time, somebody came to me with a problem. We sat down over drinks, and after listening to her and gathering all the facts, I identified her problem as one of time management. So I said to her, you have no time for the many things you need and want to do. The solution is simple. Just give up your netball. Little did I realize that netball was her life. It's no surprise that the session ended rather badly because I only listened to the facts. I failed to go deeper, to listen more, to know her feelings and to know her core values. It was only when I attended the in-service clinical pastoral education course introduced by Archdeacon Wong Tak Ming that I learned how to truly minister to people. James and his team taught us how to use intentional helping skills, IHS for short. It dawned on me that I was not ministering to people, but trying to fix their problems my way. I was imposing my solutions on them, and it was all wrong. James taught me that it is not difficult to learn the different intentional helping skills. The theory, the theoretical part of it is easy, but the real challenge is in how to use the different skills correctly and appropriately. And the real impact is felt when we practice the use of those skills in our small groups. So in our small group practice, we do not do role play. We do not use hypothetical scenarios. We share our real life personal stories or struggles and we experience for ourselves the impact when the skills are correctly applied. James must have noted my keen interest because he invited me to come back again and again for the same IHS training. The first time I attended the training as a participant, the second time I came back as an observer to learn how James facilitated a small group practice session. And then I came back a third time and was given the opportunity to facilitate a small group practice session. I'm grateful for the opportunities that James opened up for me to learn intentional helping skills. It is a valuable life skill that has helped me to grow and develop to become a better people helper. God has also sent others, such as Simon and Rinda, who mentored me on how to grow deeper with God through the spiritual disciplines of silence and solitude. I realized that the only time I experienced one-to-one -one mentoring was with Jennifer. The rest of my mentoring took place in groups. A short definition of mentoring by Christian author Stanley and Clinton captures the essence of mentoring, and I quote, Mentoring is a relational experience in which one person empowers another by sharing God-given resources, close quote. Now, what are the benefits of mentoring? For the mentee, some of the benefits are, firstly, an opportunity to acquire new knowledge, skills, and insights from someone with more experience. Secondly, to receive guidance, valuable feedback, and learn from the expertise of the mentor which can accelerate the mentee's learning and development. For the mentor, some of the benefits are, firstly, an opportunity to make a positive impact 
in the life of another person. Secondly, fulfillment in seeing another person grow and develop to what God wants him or her to be. Many years ago, I found much fulfillment in mentoring a mixed group of elderly church members, ladies and, and men. Uh, they were in their 60s and 70s, and the end goal was to help them build a strong foundation for their faith. I was so encouraged by this one gentleman in his, 60, in his 70s who hardly missed a single session. He participated actively in all our discussions and he asked very good questions. But one day he came to me looking very sad and rather troubled. He said that he has learned so much from all these sessions, but it seemed that instead of improving, he felt even more sinful. I told him he was on the right track because as we draw closer to God, who is the light, we will see more faults in ourselves, which we are to repent of. That is how we grow spiritually. He also shared that the service liturgy he had been reciting for decades every Sunday was becoming more meaningful to him. The icing on the cake was when he told me he bought a study Bible and was going to read the whole Bible from Genesis to Revelation and he was going to pay special attention to all the footnotes so that he can understand God's word better. Praise the Lord for his work in this brother's life. Church, may we embrace the ministry of mentoring. Whether we are members, whether we are, sorry, mentors or mentees, may we appreciate the true worth of mentoring for the building up of the body of Christ. To learn the nuts and bolts of the mentoring process and the attributes of a good mentor and mentee, there are many resources out there which uh, we can tap on books as well as teaching videos. Well, we can also go to our brother, Jeremy Gui, who taught a course on mentoring not too long ago. I would like to conclude with a verse from Romans chapter 12 and verse 3, where Paul said, For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. Paul exhorted the Christians in Rome to evaluate themselves with sober judgment, not to think of themselves more highly. And also I would add, not to think of themselves as too lowly. And his exhortation was given in the context of how they were to use their spiritual gifts to build up the church community. Will we then also, with sober judgment, evaluate how God has gifted us and offer ourselves as willing mentors to others? And will we also be willing to learn from and be mentored by those who are more experienced than us? Just imagine if the church can have this whole culture of mentoring. We will truly be able to grow strong and we will be able to really go further and faster in the purposes of God as we build up one another in Christ. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Let's just keep silent for a moment and allow the Holy Spirit to deepen God's word in our hearts. Let us hear what God has to say to us personally through his word today. Father, help us to learn and grow from those who have gone before us and help us also to mentor those who come after us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.